In an area as big and diverse as continental Australia, there is a great challenge to the painter of landscapes. They were artists among the earliest European arrivals, some of them commissioned to make official records, and some of them convicts who made drawings and watercolour sketches to send back to England, just as one might now send snapshots. In our art galleries, records of that period can be seen today, paintings and sketches made by men who saw Australia through European eyes. The skies and countryside of painters like English-trained Conrad Martins were often indistinguishable from the skies and countryside of other lands. It took these early painters of the landscape a long time to adjust themselves to the peculiar nature of the Australian bush and to Australian light. Their gum trees were made to look like the elms or oaks of Europe. They couldn't see at first that the leaves of the gum tree dangle and cannot be represented by tricks of the brush which they'd found suitable for the foliage of more bushy trees at home. With the gold rushes of the 1850s to Ballarat and Bendigo in Victoria came caricaturists and sketchers like S.T. Gill who began to look their surroundings square in the face. These men drew things and people with a certain roughness but they drew them at first hand and the result was that the European film began to peel off their eyes. They began to see clearly and to paint what they did see without borrowed or inherited mannerisms. This process was carried further by a Swiss painter named Louis Bouvelot who had learned fresh ways of seeing and working during several years spent painting in Brazil. Bouvelot settled in Melbourne and had quite a strong influence on some young men who were then studying in the art schools of the National Gallery of Victoria. These men, Arthur Streeton, Tom Roberts and Fred McCubbin, joined by a young Englishman, Charles Conder, decided to get out of their studios and to paint in the open air. They set up camps in the bush on the outskirts of Melbourne and Sydney. They were young and brilliantly gifted. Their eyes saw the dazzle and their hands caught it. The whole landscape seemed to sing with blue and gold, and its people, its drovers, shearers, bushrangers and stockmen to come to life. The kind of art inspired by this group of artists is typified in this painting of Sir Arthur Streeton's The Purple Noon's Transparent Light. There was at this time a great upsurge of national feeling and a pride in this land for its own sake as a place where the artist belonged. This kind of painting with its devotion to certain ways of capturing the light falling on the land has occupied some artists ever since. One of its most consistent adherents has been Hans Heysen of South Australia. Even the title of his picture, Red Gold, indicates what he looked for and what he found all about him. Sir Hans has spent half a lifetime painting in and around the Flinders Ranges with their worn contours thrown into relief and their shapes moulded by sun and shadow. His studio at Harndorf was built to his own design from the local stone and trees he has loved and painted. And here Heysen, now over 80 and surrounded by his own canvases, continues to paint in both oils and watercolours the land he has made his. His paintings are as uncompromising and as forthright as his views on much modern painting of the Australian landscape, of which he says, Well, I feel it's an essential quality is uh, its intensity and brilliancy of lighting. And also its uh, colouring is quite unique. Uh, the Australian landscape painter uh, is losing touch with nature altogether. He's too confined uh, to the studio and uh, adopting the isms of overseas and becoming international instead of being a painter of his own country, living in it and loving it. Under the influence of such artists, 
people came to think of the Australian landscape only as it appeared in the romantic and lyrical pictures of artists like Streeton and Hyson. There were, too, the new Australian legends such as Sidney Nolan painted. Ned Kelly, with his homemade suit of armour and lawless life, was a symbol of rebellion and courage. Nolan made of this and other subjects strangely moving pictures which seemed to catch the spirit of the land. And there was the undiscovered country of the vast, dry and infinitely mysterious outback with its lonely people and its almost heroic characters. Painters like Nolan and Russell Drysdale, found in this old continent in its stones, its endless horizons, its eroded hills, and indeed in its very agelessness, something primitive and yet wonderful, which had escaped the eyes of earlier artists who had sometimes seen only the picturesque. Drysdale himself puts this in his own way. In every landscape, there seems to be two elements. The landscape itself and its broad whole, and the furniture or the objects that go to make it. Trees and stumps, such as a small stone which looks like a boulder on a clay pan. All of these things within themselves are like a miniature landscape that one can hold within one's hands. But when you look away from it, back to the horizon, it is this hole that contains all these small and varied parts which are so exciting within themselves. The arching forms of trees, the feathered look of the horizon with its stunted growth, one will come across the bizarre shapes blown by the wind or fallen by the way, which seem to have within themselves a secret sort of life. But it is in their relationship one to the other that they assume a dynamic quality. Since the war, not only has the continent itself yielded more to the artist, but the continent of the mind has been explored. Artists have come to discover and to express more and more of what it is that is awakened in them by the surroundings. To capture or convey these discoveries requires more and more concern with the formal qualities of painting. The artist relies less on the accident of what the eye sees and much more on the actual creation, the making of a work of art. It is enough that it is a thing of beauty, not of imaginative excitement. Above all, it must be true to its own requirements, its own economy of drawing, shape and colour. A versatile artist who has experimented in many styles is Charles Bush. He does not necessarily speak for other contemporary painters, but his viewpoint indicates that there is no limit to the ways in which artists may express themselves or what they see. Like a lot of Australian painters, I live and work in a city. The colour excitement is still there, even though the landscape is now buildings instead of rocks and mountains. Girders replace the tracery of bare trees. Bitumen streets replace country roads and red earth. The face and forms of the city are changing, as the face and forms of painting change over the years. And like a lot of my contemporaries, I've found my earlier technique unsuitable for these new and vital landscapes. Using straight edges that seem to have the city forms already in them gives me the means to urgently state my excitement about steel patterns, viaducts, power lines and the general pulse of a big city. Perhaps to many this is not the conventional material for paintings, but it is the artist who responds to these new developments and through his art reveals the poetry and excitement where it had not been clearly seen or felt before. The laws of art are quite different from the laws of nature, and one should not expect them to be the same. But in both, there are endless possibilities. And it is the role of the artist to open worlds, including worlds of the mind, never opened before. And there are wonderful discoveries to be made in the works of art which have originated in this landscape. A landscape changing and being changed. A 
landscape that is a constant challenge to the painter. Australian light. Their gum trees were made to look like the elms or oaks of Europe. They couldn't see at first that the leaves of the gum tree dangle and cannot be represented by tricks of the brush which they'd found suitable for the foliage of more bushy trees at home. So that period can be seen today, paintings and sketches made by men who saw Australia through European eyes. The skies and countryside of painters like English-trained Conrad Martins were often indistinguishable from the skies and countryside of other lands. It took these early painters of the landscape a long time to adjust themselves to the peculiar nature of the Australian bush. In an area as big and diverse as continental Australia, there is a great challenge to the painter of landscapes. They were artists among the earliest European arrivals, some of them commissioned to make official records, and some of them convicts who made drawings and watercolour sketches to send back to England, just as one might now send snapshots. In our art galleries, records... With the gold rushes of the 1850s to Ballarat and Bendigo in Victoria came caricaturists and sketchers like S.T. Gill who began to look their surroundings square in the face. These men drew things and people with a certain roughness, but they drew them at first hand. And the result was that the 